Hello and welcome to Old Canyon Forge. I'm Dan Rothblatt. We're doing the second part in our series on how to make a knife with the minimal tools. Uh, this means the minimal investment in tools. And the second part of our project in making our knife is to heat treat it. And in order to do that, we need some sort of heat source to get it up to 1500 degrees. And for that, we're going to make a two brick forge. This is the minimum investment that you will need to uh, be able to heat treat your knife. Uh, apart from sending it out to heat treat, which you can do. Um, but I'm assuming you want to do it at home. This is a uh, two brick forge. And it is composed simply of two insulating fire bricks. I will explain the difference in a few moments. These are not the bricks you get at Home Depot or your you know, brick and mortar store. We are going to use to, as the heat source, this Harbor Freight. Uh, they call it the propane torch with three burners, and this is it. And you can simply use a regular little propane tank. If you want to spend an extra 12 bucks and you think you're going to be doing this a bit, um, I found it better to hook this up to a larger propane tank, and for that you'll need an adapter. Basically, this has one end which fits onto a regular barbecue propane tank, those little 20 pound tanks, and the other end fits onto here. Um, and I'll put a link down below. Uh, let's get started. I'll show you how to make this. It's fairly simple. The first thing we got to talk about is the difference between an insulating fire brick and a fire brick. A fire brick is what you can get at Home Depot or Osh or whatever. And essentially it's a brick which is refractory material and it's rated to 2600 degrees or 2300 degrees. That's fine. This is really hard. This weighs about what one of your red regular bricks weigh. Insulating fire brick weighs about two thirds of that. Um, they're very soft. I can scratch it and break off pieces with my fingernail, and we can carve them very easy, but the main thing about them is that they're insulating, whereas this will soak up heat, this will reflect heat. This does not soak it up. If you try to use this brick, your little torch is going to spend forever trying to get the brick hot before it gets the forge hot. This one, the surface gets hot right away, but the inside doesn't. It reflects all that heat into the inside, and it'll get hot within just a few minutes. Essentially, all a two brick forge is, is two bricks wired together with a cylindrical hole cut down the center. On this one, I left the top half of the brick uncarved for about an inch in there on both sides. I have this weird theory that that will keep some of the heat in because heat rises and I find on my big forges that affects it. Um, but on this one it probably makes no difference whatsoever. Uh, it only gets a small section hot. In the side of the forge is a hole and in that hole your torch sticks in and heats up, your, heats up the for furnace. So you get a small flame going in a spiral pattern, and I'll show you that later, um, inside, which will heat up from the hole back about three inches. And that'll be the hottest part, your sweet spot in the, in the forge. So you really can't heat treat a knife larger than probably about four, maybe five inches, because you can kind of move it back and forth. This one has a two-inch diameter hole cut in it. I tried one with the size of a coffee can, which is about a three and a half inch diameter hole, I think, and it's uh, too big. It's not bad. It gets it to, I put a parameter in it, that one gets it to uh, about 16, 1650 max, which is fine for heat treating. This one goes up to about 1900 degrees in there, uh, which you could actually do a little forging with, um, and maybe we'll do that. We're going to start by marking where we're going to cut. First I'm going to set the dividers at one inch, so this will make a two inch diameter circle. I'll then put the bricks on end and we'll find the center 
of the bricks. I think they're four and a half inches wide, so two and a quarter inches. We scribe a circle with the dividers. And then mark in the scribed line with the Sharpie. The pen tip will follow the scribe. When we're done with this, we just rinse and repeat on the other side. Now we're just going to carry the ends of those arcs onto the inside and connect them. And that will be the half circle tube that we're going to carve out. We'll make this one the top, so we'll just mark a little section here about an inch wide where we're not going to carve out the brick. We'll carve the area that I put the hash marks in. Okay, I used my angle grinder and just flattened out the end of this. Uh, so I got a kind of a sharp edge, and uh, we're putting on my respirator, and let's get to going. Let's get going. Uh. I'm starting out with my little pipe tool, and it's actually working surprisingly well. You could easily do the entire carving job with this, but. I, of course, wanted to go faster, so I pulled out my old angle grinder with a cut-off wheel, and I just basically cut a bunch of offset diagonals and just chipped them out. Same thing you do on a piece of wood. It really sped up the process. First one done. On this one, it's uh, the one where we're not going to do the two ends. And I'm not even going to start with a pipe. We're just going to start right away with the angle grinder and chop off these diagonal lines. You can see how I'm doing pretty easily right here. I'm utilizing a screwdriver here just to kind of get into the corners as best I can. And then back to our old friend, the pipe. It really does work quite well. As you can see, that didn't take long at all. I think I was at it for about 20 minutes. The top, uh, the top is not as deep as this. I'm just going to leave it a little more shallow, just a little less that it has to heat up. And as you can see, when it goes together, what we have is an opening on the bottom to put our knife in. Thus. And uh, now what we have to do is make a opening for the uh, torch to go in. The torch, first of all, we want it to go in and swirl in this cavity a little bit. We want it to get an uh, area in the center hot. Um, we don't want to pinpoint heat, or just the torch blasting on our piece. It's going to oxidize it. So I'm going to bring it in through the top, which is this piece. So, and we're going to angle it back, back about this angle. So, Make sure I got the right side. Yeah, because this is going to be the front. So, okay. Show you how to do that now. Okay. 
We're simply going to cut a groove there, so let's mark how big we want that to be. Um, and this torch is the same size, so we'll use this torch, pencil. Let's see. So that's what we're going to cut off. We're going to go about that angle. We might have to take a little off of the bottom here. But we will see. Ooh, the pencil mark made a mark here, so I know exactly where my mark is. That's nice. So if you use pencil on this, like that, yeah, I'll do it again. Yeah. You can trace your marks there. Wonderful discovery. We're going to do this really simply. It's going to be much like the angle grinder technique, but by hand. I'm just going to take. Hacksaw and gently cut that in. So any saw will work, or you can just in fact, use something like that and just grind it out um, on your own. And that works fine too. So normally I take a rasp file and file that out. You can use a piece of uh, black pipe, but it's a little big. You can use a half inch instead of three quarter. I got a piece of rebar here. The burr on the end, which is from them cutting it off, seems to work very nicely. And actually the ribs on this do Work like a file. We'll continue filing away a little at a time till we get it to the right size. There we go. It's a loose fit, which is fine. This is not precision work here. Okay, so we have. Our basic forge body made. We now need to keep it together somehow, so we're going to do that with some binding wire. And I'm going to cut some grooves in here. I'm going to use the hacksaw. So that's so all I need to do. Um, but I will mark them. So we want one here. We want one about there, and we'll do one across this side the same. Voila! We are done. Don't do that. Dust everywhere. Or your respirator. Anyway, so we got this done, and now we're going to take binding wire out. Try to straighten it as best we can. I found that hitting it with a rawhide mallet on a flat surface works really well. If you don't have that, hit it with a piece of wood on a flat surface. That will probably work just as well. Um, let's see, we want to have the top like that, just 
trying to get my length here. A little more on this side there. Not that much. Some sort of wire cutters you will need. A hammer on the edge of a surface will work very nicely. I've done that many times. So now I'll open, straighten this out. Give myself four pieces that length. Okay. I just used a piece of wood like this. Now I left the last half so you can see what I did. So you just take. I'm just turning it 90 degrees and just getting it until it kind of straightens out. It's all those um, rough bends out of there. Okay, now we're just going to center this side to side and un put it under one of the sets of notches. Then we're going to bend it on the bottom here. Nice tight bend. Top, nice tight bend. Okay, needle nose. Bring that up there. Bring that up there. And we're just going to tighten this up. And do the same to this. Well, it's exciting, we're done. There's our forge body. Okay, so I put a uh, little binding wire on one of my top things to hold this in place that's supported. These little uh, canisters um, freeze up pretty quick. They get cold fast. Um, you can put them in a bucket of water, like the bottom in a water, like this deep. So they'll uh, keep, keep from freezing up, but it, it, as they get colder, the pressure goes down, your heat goes down. You can buy one of these. Uh, this is a connection to the um, back of this torch, and this goes into a regular like barbecue propane canister, and it'll never freeze that puppy up. And if we're doing forging, if we try, can try to do that on this later, um, you would use that. Um, I recommend that at least. Let's give it a go. You don't want the tip inside the forge. It's brass and it will simply melt. We want it angled slightly up, as you can see here, and we want it angled back like that. The angle of the tip causes the flame to swirl like a corkscrew towards the back of the forge. So instead of hitting one spot, it heats a whole section of the forge. Here I've added a pyrometer into the hottest section of the forge, and we've seen we've got it over 2,000 degrees, which is certainly enough to forge with. Um, too hot to heat treat, but the torch has a pretty nice uh, fine adjustment on it, so we can turn it down. Well, it's time to heat treat the knife. In the can next to the forge there, I have a little bit of peanut oil. Uh, many people use canola oil. And what I'm doing here is just warming it up. We want this oil to be about 120 degrees. So I just heat up a piece of rebar to red hot and stick it in there. And you can feel the sides of the can to see if it's uh, warm enough. Usually one quench will do it.
the adjustment on the torch is very fine. So use a very light touch on it. I tried a few different pliers and found that uh, these work really nice. Just a regular pair of pliers will be fine for this. This little furnace just doesn't blow a lot of heat out of it. You can see that the knife is pushed far enough in that the actual blade is pretty much past the hot spot inside the forge. The reason for this is that you want to heat up the handle area a bit first because it will act as a heat sink and pull the heat out of the base of the blade and prevent it from getting up to heat. To gauge the temperature of the blade, we're going to put table salt on it. Table salt melts at about 1475, and that will, uh, is about the right temperature for us to quench. So by putting this in, we can pretty much see when it melts and get an idea, at least, of when the blade is the right temperature. The salt is melted and the blade looks pretty evenly hot, so let's get ready to quench that puppy. Okay, the salt has started to melt. You see the blade is red, the spine's a little hotter than the edge, so I'm going to just bring it back and forth in here and tilt it a little bit. It's the base of the blade where it's thickest at uh, the choil that's going to take longest to heat up. Try to get the whole thing even red. I have a couple inches there that are the right heat. Now I'm going to flip it so the edge is towards where the flame is swirling down. I want to make sure my edge is hot. This in just a second. And this is hot to the touch, which is good. And here we go. You want to agitate it or move it back and forth like this. Is red was dull red up to the uh, drilled hole there, so I want to make sure that that cools down a bit so it doesn't heat up the blade too much. It's kind of like a flux, but the other side, which doesn't have the salt, see how the um, scale comes off easy there, but not up here. That went hard, this didn't. One way to tell. It won't be hard yet until it completely cools off, so we're going to just put it down to cool off right here. And we have a hardened blade. has been hardened. It needs to be tempered. 
hardened, if I took this and whacked it against my anvil, the tip would snap right off. It's very hard, but it's very brittle. So now we temper it to give it some toughness. If you want to find out more specifics on that, you can do some reading up on that, but we're just going to go through the process here. Tempering is the process of bringing the steel up to about 400 degrees, somewhere between 375 and 450, depending on how hard you want the knife. We're going to go 400 degrees. To do this, we're just going to put it in your household oven. Now, if you have a partner, he or she might not like that so much. Um, the knife has been quenched in oil, and the oil is going to burn off and stink up the house. So clean it off really good with soap and water so that we don't get any of that smoke. Second thing is kitchen ovens, um, even if you use a little toaster oven, they don't keep a very consistent temperature. They go up and down. It's about 50, 60 degrees because your roast has a lot of thermal mass. It doesn't heat up and cool down really quick. Your knife, very thin, doesn't have a lot of thermal mass. So it'll go up and down. And we don't want this to go over 400 degrees. So what we're going to do is we're going to bury it in some sand. And once the sand gets up to temperature, it's going to kind of keep the same consistent temperature and make our blade that. So I've got a little container here. This is just something I had around the shop. And I filled it with sand. And you can use any container you want that's oven safe. You can use a little um, cake tin, um, like a 4x8 cake tin, or uh, anything like that. Fill it with sand. Bury the knife in it. Mound up the sand around a little bit there like that. Make sure the sand's above and below it. And stick it in your oven. Leave it for two hours. Take it out. Take the knife out of there. Let it cool down to room temperature. Put the knife back in. This will be hot, careful. Put it in for another two hours. So, two hours. Let it cool to room temperature in two hours. Um, also, don't put this in the oven until your knife is cooled down to room temperature and you've cleaned it off. Do not wait too long to do this. You want to do it within a half hour, an hour after you've hardened it. The reason for this is the knife is in a very stressed state. You've created a very brittle, hard knife, and the molecules are locked and really stressed. Tempering also reduces that stress. And with that, we're done with this video. In our next video, we'll take this and turn it into this, finishing the knife. We'll hand sand the blade, make it all nice and pretty. We'll put on the handle and glue it. We'll shape it. We'll uh, sand it and oil it. And we'll sharpen the blade. We'll see you there.